Good, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, we have uh, a Temasek Distinguished Visitor Lecture uh, this, uh, this evening uh, on the topic of how Israel became an innovation hub. Uh, let me introduce our, our, our speaker. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Eugene Kandel of the Hebrew University uh, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, Professor Kandel served as the head of the National Economic Council and the economic advisor to the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, from July 2009 until August uh, 2015, so just until, until a couple of months ago. Uh, under his leadership, the NEC has become the central force of uh, shaping economic policy in Israel and promoting its growth. It contributes to various areas of policy, macro and, uh, and, and micro, uh, as well as the establishment of the Sovereign Wealth Fund, energy, uh, antitrust, and other issues. Uh, Professor Kandel uh, studied in uh, both Israel and in the United States. Uh, he's a Chicago uh, PhD, and he taught at uh, American universities before returning to Israel uh, since 1997. Uh, he has been a professor of economics and finance at the Hebrew University. Uh, now, uh, many of you might well have read uh, a bestseller some years ago, uh, The Startup Nation uh, by Dan Senor and Saul Singer. Well, Professor Kandel uh, is going to explain to us uh, this extraordinary story of how Israel has really carved out a remarkable niche in uh, innovation. Uh, Professor Kandel, welcome to uh, NUS and the Lee Kuan Yew School, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. I really uh, like to be in Singapore. This is my second time, and I look forward to coming many, many more times, especially given the reception that I'm getting. You know, it would be silly not to. Uh, I wanted to uh, say a couple of things before starting. First, uh, like, uh, like Professor Ali said, I'm no longer the head of the National Economic Council. I'm the ex-head of the National Economic Council, so um, I'm no longer responsible for the, for the policy of, the, of uh, the government, which is a big relief after six years. Second thing, I am, this is my first day, and I made it specifically for this lecture, so I can start this lecture presenting the, uh, this sign, which is a non-for-profit organization, which I'll explain what it is. This is my first day as a CEO of that non-for-profit, and the reason for this starting today, rather than when I come back, was that I can actually present this as a CEO of Startup Nation Central which, of course, as you figured out, it relates to the book, and I'll explain how it came about. And the last thing is that in the last two days, I've learned something very interesting. There's a building across, the, uh, across this uh, lawn, which is called Menasseh Meyer Building. Menasseh Meyer was the head of Jewish community in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Singapore. He's originally from Calcutta, and he donated a significant amount of money to the establishment of this university. Right about the same time as he did that, Albert Einstein came to Singapore in 1926, I believe, and he spoke to Manasseh Meyer, and Manasseh Meyer also donated, at the same time, roughly, a significant amount of money for establishment of my university. So we have connection through Manasseh Meyer to, between the NUS and, and Hebrew University, which was very, very touching. So let's, let's talk about, about Israel ecosystem. So uh, first of all, let's locate Israel, okay? Where is Israel? It's a big flag, okay, uh, because the place is very small. <laughs> because we need to identify where it is. It's actually not, it's, it's actually pretty centrally located. Like, now Singapore is here, and we're here, and we're actually fairly close. If there was a direct flight, it would be only eight and a half hours, which is about the same, the same amount that you need to fly from here to Sydney. So this was, uh, we definitely need a direct flight um, to, to be connected. So that's where we are. 
uh, we're somewhat bigger than, than, than Singapore in, in terms of land, but it's a, a little bit misleading because much of our country is a desert, and much of that desert is occupied by our defense forces because they have to train somewhere. So, they, um, so you know, we are, we are fairly dense uh, as well. And uh, this is, so that's, that's uh, geographically. Uh, uh, we have a, uh, an image uh, being a country of entrepreneurs, but that's actually not something that you see in statistics. If you look at the rate at which Israel generates new enterprises, uh, it's not actually not very high. It's about the average of the OECD. So we, if you just look at the statistic, it's not, it's not particularly impressive. Uh, now I wanted to talk a bit, take it aside, and, 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 and talk to you about innovation. Uh, this is my view on innovation, is that there are two types. There's one type of innovation which arises of continuous, from continuous learning and improvement, how to take existing resources, existing technologies, and make them better, to produce more, to, to produce better things out of existing technologies, or both. And so that requires, in order to do that, think about it as like building a wall or building a pyramid. So you start with a base and you continuously build on that base. So this is a, this is a continuous improvement. It can be more jump, faster, slower. But in that process, you can have several generations of people that make really, really marginal improvements. Then suddenly industrial revolution comes and you make a big improvement. So that uh, changed something. So that, that type of innovation requires very stable environment because you need to, because your knowledge that you accumulated in a particular environment have to be relevant uh, for, the, for the future. So, you know, basic conditions need to be very, very stable. And it usually um, builds on a strong knowledge base because everything that you've accumulated is very relevant yesterday to tomorrow as well. Um, there's a type two innovation Type 2 of innovation is when your environment suddenly changes completely. Okay? Your previous knowledge, I mean, it doesn't happen in a stable environment, so stable environment definitely not, not a prerequisite for that. Uh, and in some sense, all the knowledge or much of the knowledge that you accumulated about the previous environment becomes obsolete because the environment now is, is, is completely different. So you need to actually rely on, not rely as much on the historical knowledge, but to rely on some, some other set of skills. And so these two innovations arise in, in, a, different, in a different set of, of um, environments. I sometimes uh, compare these to in biology, in nature. There are two types of innovations, right? You think about this type of innovation that, that was, uh, uh, oops, no, sorry. Uh, this type of innovation, the type one, is the one that was uh, uh, created when, uh, when plants or, or animals uh, reproduced through asexual uh, reproduction. Okay, they would just multiply themselves. And over time, they adjusted themselves to the best they could to the environment in which they lived. And so it's the most efficient way if your environment is stable. And so you become very, very adjusted. You cover, you know, if you plant, you cover everything, etc. But then your environment changes and the entire species die. Because they're all the same. And so if one of them dies because of the change in the, in the temperature or change in the acidity or change in something, the entire species just, just got wiped out. So the, the, since nature frequently undergoes changes, what we see is the majority of, of uh, plants and, and, and animals and you know, live organisms reproduce through sexual reproduction process, which the difference between the two is that you constantly change. Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, mutations, and so it's not that you adapt to the new, uh, to the new environment, it's just that different mutations are better, are better uh, in the new environment, some mutations are better in the old environment. So if the environment didn't change, those that are better for the old environment dominate, and the others die. If the environment changes, then the old ones die, and the new ones uh, can, uh, continue. Given that the organisms are always fighting with all kinds of viruses and, and common, you know, all kinds of parasites that are prey on us, this is, and they constantly mutate as well, uh, the, the second type is very, very important for survival, uh, for survival of the species. I'll come back to that. Uh, and so if you take the second type of innovation, 
and combine that with entrepreneurship, this is what we call a startup. Okay, startup is, a, is, a, um, is an organization that it doesn't really matter whether it just started three months ago, whether it's you know, five years old. It's an organization that, uh, that has some kind of innovative, drastically innovative process, or either process or technology or something, and it's scalable. Okay, a coffee shop is not a startup in, in that definition. I mean, it's, a, it's an entrepreneurial activity, but it's not a startup. So here we take this country, uh, and we it turns out that it has the highest number, even though it's not entrepreneurial, particularly entrepreneurial in, in, in global measures, in this particular measure, it has about one startup for every 2,000 people, which is way, way higher than majority of, of countries. Uh, so this is, this is one part of that ecosystem. I'll talk afterwards to try to, to, to give you my view on, on how this whole thing evolved and, and, and where is it going, but, but this, is, this is a fact. In terms of global innovation ranking, um, Israel is ranked third out of, out of 144 countries. Uh, this is uh, the Global Competitive Report of WEF uh, Forum, World Economic Forum. Uh, based mostly on, on the previous uh, number. Uh, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, globally, is quite high, uh, even though it's a much smaller city. You get uh, Silicon Valley is the first. I actually think that Tel Aviv uh, in, in the area, if you take the area like in Boston, I think it has more startups than Boston and Los Angeles, but uh, you know, I'm not going to argue with, with this. Uh, there's an interesting thing is Jerusalem was chosen as uh, one of the five top places that are upcoming to that, to that list. So the, the, the upcoming uh, startup centers, Jerusalem features very, very prominently there, which I'm happy about because this is my city. Uh, R&D expenditure ranking. Um, this is 2009. I'm not sure why they gave me 2009, but uh, one thing is interesting is that uh, Israel was uh, very high uh, before. Uh, Sweden was a bit higher in 1999. In 2009, it was uh, the highest um, as a percentage of GDP. Most of it, by the way, if you measure the government spending on, on R&D, it's fairly, it's not low, but it's not, not at all one of the highest in the world, so it's mostly the private sector. The interesting thing that what happened since 2009 and 2014 is that the order roughly stayed the same, except one country, which is Korea, moved higher and higher and higher, and this year I believe they overtook us. So they are uh, very, very different, different, um, or indeed, these are huge corporations. The, the, in Israel, it's completely different, uh, different spending on R&D. But you know, we are happy to be in this competition where, where we, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we will see how. Uh. And one of the things that, that really um, uh, characterizes Israel is that we have one of the highest, if not the highest, proportions of uh, scientists and engineers in, uh, in the country, partially because in 1990s, a huge influx of uh, Jews from the former Soviet Union came to, to Israel, and there was a disproportionate number of scientists and engineers in that population. But we also generate quite a lot. At the same time, the economy is so skewed into the high tech, we have uh, probably the highest percentage of population employed in high tech industry, and so we have shortages of, the, of scientists and engineers still. Not because they're not, not many, but because they're not enough. Because there's too much, too much demand. Uh, venture capital, um, Israel again, uh, because startups need uh, financing, and who finances startups? Basically VCs. So uh, VCs, uh, you know, angels, etc. But the venture capital uh, supply to Israel, uh, these are two numbers. This is 2010, this is 2000. Uh, on the right is 2014. On the left is 2010. You can see that Israel in 2010 was 170. Uh, I don't even know what it is. I think it's 170 dollars per per person. Uh, United States was about 70. 
Uh, United States increased it dramatically, so it went from 70 to 163. Israel, in the last four years, went from 170 to, to, to 230. This is, uh, you know, it's a combination of two things. A, there's a lot of money coming in, but B, there are not that many people. Okay, so the density of that, uh, of that stuff is very, very high. Um, Interestingly, uh, you know, I was asked in the interview uh, about a half an hour ago, um, how can we maintain this uh, given that we sort of have somewhat non-stable geopolitical situation around us, et cetera, you know, we not, everybody knows that the neighborhood in which that flag was put is not the most calm of neighborhoods that you could wish to live in. Uh, unfortunately, you can't just get up and move like you do in the in, in the neighborhood if you don't like it. So, uh, but the VC community realizes that that is sort of detached from that world, the technological world is not, is not particularly connected to that. And so uh, the highest investor confidence, this is Deloitte's uh, global uh, VC confidence survey from 2014. You can see that uh, highest confidence in the Silicon Valley and the United States in general, but the second one is, 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 uh, is Israel. Uh, fairly, fairly big lead. So, you know, a priori, you could have imagined that there might be, some, you know, concerns, etc. Uh, now, growth and maturi maturity. Um, in the 90s, uh, the path, the normal path for an Israeli company that would get financing from VC, A round, B round, and then get to the valuation of 30, 40, 50 million dollars, it would go on NASDAQ. There was like a path well traveled, it was almost predetermined. At the end of 1990s, Israel had more companies listed on NASDAQ than any other country in the world. It actually at some point had more companies listed on NASDAQ than entire Europe. Okay? Because there was these small companies, we were generating them at a very high speed. Um, now we are either third or fourth, depending, we are constantly competing with Canada. There's, uh, we are plus minus one. So the second country now is, is China. But the last deca decade, uh, uh, what happened in the, uh, and, this is, and this is interesting and, and per perhaps can serve as a, as a lesson, that it's very, very important to look at the entire ecosystem for, you know, Singaporean government was asking me various questions about the development, even though I think that they can teach me the level of, of familiarity with the Israeli system in, in Singaporean government such that they can give this lecture better than I can. Uh, definitely in Temasek, um, the level of familiarity is much better than in my part. But um, in uh, 2000, there was a crash in 2001. NASDAQ collapsed. And then there were all kinds of corporate scandals. And in this, during these scandals, the public got really outraged. And uh, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley um, legislation passed through. And it made it practically impossible for its mid-sized company, or by our standards, a small company, to list on a US exchange. So if you could list before at 30, 40 million dollars, now you cannot list below 200 million. Okay, so suddenly that whole area of financing disappeared from, from the Israeli landscape. So investment bankers looked around and said, well, if this is not available and the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange is not a tech exchange, so where are we going to go? And so they went for an M&A route. And so since then, the majority of exits, which is, uh, by the way, something that we see also in Singapore in the recent, uh, you know, yesterday, today I was talking to, uh, I was shown some numbers. Most of exits today are also M&A in, in Singapore VC. Uh, in Singapore high-tech industry as well. So the government sort of missed that. They missed the fact that there's a whole bunch of these financial ecosystem disappeared. And they didn't act, and nobody else acted, and you know, there was a mess in 2002, everybody, you know, if you remember, NASDAQ went from 5,000 to, to 2,500, so nobody was particularly interested in, in, in that. Everybody was saying that tech is dead, and the dot com, and so. So this was not a natural time to try to attract. But we, we, and in Israel there was a crisis in 2002, 2003, all, you know, local crisis. So basically we, we, we slept through it. And so only recently in the last five, six years we started working on, on trying to bring more capital, late stage capital, 
and trying to create um, create uh, more favorable conditions for perhaps listing on, on Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, et cetera. But the last decade was mostly m and and that created a very interesting phenomenon. The phenomenon is this, is that today we have over 300 multinationals, tech multinationals, we have R&D uh, centers in, in, in Israel. In fact, uh, some multinationals that you would recognize here, for example, um, you know where they are, uh, Intel, uh, these guys, and Motorola, and Applied Instruments, Applied Materials, sorry, they were in Israel very, very early. Motorola started in Israel in 1971. This is 25 years before anybody started sort of thinking of Israel as a tech center. Nobody thought of Israel as a tech center when I came to Israel. I immigrated in 1977. This was, you know, oranges and, and diamonds, what was our main, main export. But these companies realized that there was a lot of potential in, in uh, various areas coming from universities and from the army, so they set up uh, centers early. But majority of these companies came to Israel through acquisition of Israeli startups. So let me give you a recent example. Apple. Uh, Apple had only R&D facilities in their, in their uh, California, you know, uh, Silicon Valley location. And then they were looking for a particular technology and they founded an Israeli company called Anabit. Don't ask me what the technology is, I have no idea. But, they, uh, but it was sufficiently interesting that they bought it for $300 million. And so then they, uh, they said to themselves, okay, we can do three things. We can try to take these 300 people and relocate them to California. Wouldn't work because they don't want, you know, they have families, they want to live in Israel, so maybe some would go, but majority wouldn't. We can just forget about 300 people, take the IP, move it to California, and forget about all these things. Or we can set up something here, leave these 300 people, maybe even increase it, and start developing this technology further and further and expanding, etc. And so, like many other companies, large companies that you see here and many, many more, uh, decided that the third alternative was much better because that offered them uh, a chance to get a tap into that pool of high, uh, high quality human capital and already co cohesive uh, group that was developing really cool stuff. So they did it, but once that happens, uh, they start putting people who start uh, scouting other companies. And so they suddenly start buying another company. So recently they bought another company in Israel. Mm -hmm. This is the first place they ever put R&D center outside of their main location. And that's actually true for many, many Akamai and others, that, that the first place they ever go is in Israel, not because they decided deliberately to put an R&D center, but because of this M&A. So our sort of blunder created this universe. Okay? When I came to my position in 2009, there were 220 R&D centers. In 2000, there were probably 30. So this is all the last 15 years process. And even in the last, in the last six years, it was uh, 80 or plus added, added up. So is this good or is this bad? By the way, uh, some of them are buying companies all the time. Cisco bought 13 Israeli companies. They started with one, then bought another one, bought another one, and so now they have 5,000 or 6,000 people working for them in Israel, in mostly in R&D and related areas. Um, is this good or is this bad? Well, like you say, everything in life is good in moderation. Now, the problem is, uh, what is the problem? The problem, if you look at it, is that uh, these companies uh, take most of the value that is created there and, uh, and accrue it elsewhere. So we don't get to benefit from that value. These people that work for these companies are very, very well compensated. Since there is somewhat shortage of them, their salaries are very high. The salaries are roughly on par with the Silicon Valley salaries, which is n not to be said that our you know, level standard of living is the same as in the United States. So they are, there's a much bigger discrepancy between them and their peers in Israel, then between Silicon Valley and their peers in the United States. So that is a bit of a problem. But the biggest problem in that is that uh, the multiplier, employment multiplier that these companies provide, 
is instead of being one for every engineer or every scientist, you have four other people working in the company, you know, doing business, uh, doing, uh, doing accounting, doing legal studies, doing logistics, you know, normal company that has, uh, these guys employ for every engineer, they employ one other person instead of four. So there is a much less impact on the rest of the, on the, rest of the economy. This is the minus. The plus, however, is that these companies understand that this is a good place to, to, to create things. And so they bring technologies from outside. They bring management from outside. And we get spillovers from that into other companies. So people quit these companies and start new companies with ideas that they received because there was. So like I said, we would love to have these, these companies continue to, to operate in Israel. But we would also love to have a system which would allow companies that cannot, uh, that, that do not have to be sold, uh, uh, that if they have a chance to become a big company, they should become a big company in Israel. Okay? So this is something that, uh, that Singapore is already somewhat facing. And, and, and the, the question is, how do you create an ecosystem that, that can create not only continuity in financing and in, in the management skills, but also the expectation of that continuity. Because that was very important. Because even when the capital was available, people that were starting that and, and coming to the finish line or to the exit, they were not sure that three or four years from now, if they continue to grow their company, there will be sufficient capital to, to sustain them. So they were saying, look, you're offering me now you know, $100 million. I'll take it. I'm not going to take chances. The situation, by the way, is changing. Uh, but again, this is their pluses, their minuses. Just recent examples. This is Rakuten, the, the Japanese company. Amazon just bought a company. Google bought uh, Waze. For example, this is an interesting case. Waze is a company that I was very proud to see a taxi driver this morning having uh, navigating with Waze uh, in Mandarin. So this was great. I loved it. And so he was. Uh, I told him I'm very happy that he uses it. He didn't, so we had a whole conversation around it. He said it's the best uh, thing that, uh, that he uses, and so I was happy. This was an interesting company that completely revolutionized, uh, apropos the second type of innovation, completely revolutionized the whole concept because there were a whole bunch of companies that did tracking, satellites, you know, all, all, all these high, there was a company, I forgot its name, that were putting, you know, millions of monitors on, on the streets to, to, to monitor the entire traffic in the entire world. And suddenly this company comes and says, look, you know, these cars are driving around. Why don't we just let them report to us what's going on? And so that completely changed it. But that company probably needed to be on a much larger platform. Its value as a standalone would have been much less than its value within a Google platform. And we see already that it's been, it's been um, improving and, 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 and expanding its reach, etc. So this is a good case. But that company, if they didn't believe that it could obtain financing, uh, would have been sold for $50 million 10 years ago. Okay? So we, the fact that it, was, that it persevered and was sold for a billion dollars rather than being sold for $50 million, that's, that was a result from supports of all kinds of supports. So PayPal, Dropbox, Apple, IBM, Facebook, etc. So you see, you see names that, that, that every one of us recognizes. These are just last two years. Uh, of course, there were many more. Uh, part of that ecosystem are accelerators. Uh, uh, some accelerators are, are corporate. This is Coca-Cola Accelerator. Some accelerators, this is, I don't know, anybody who read the, the Startup Nation book knows what is 8200 means. 8200 is a unit, intelligence unit, that became an, like almost a synonymous with the, with the various uh, parts of the, uh, of the ecosystem. They actually have an accelerator, which a lady that reports to me in the Startup Nation Central actually started it and continues to run it. Mass Challenge just announced, this is one of the uh, very good accelerators, comes out of Boston, just announced uh, an accelerator. They're putting it in Jerusalem. So there's a very vibrant uh, universe of those things. Uh, incubators, uh, like in Singapore, uh, there are some incubators that are completely private, but the government also has a program of subsidizing incubators in, in various areas. 
Uh, so you can see Philips and Teva. Teva, uh, uh, you can't read this because it's in Hebrew, but this is the name of Teva. This is a $30 billion generic drugs company. It has an incubator, Alpha Strauss. Uh, this is a company, um, large food and water company. This is JVP, Jerusalem Venture Partners, Cyber Labs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we are very big on co-working spaces. That's a very interesting phenomenon. Because in the last five years, the advent of, um, of cloud reduced the cost of starting a startup in, that has anything to do with uh, large data and large uh, processing capabilities. Because it used to be that in order to start a startup, you had to buy all kinds of servers. You had to have a lot of space and a lot of... Uh, cap, um, uh, capex, uh, capital expenditure. Today, you just rent some space from Amazon, you, you don't buy anything, you get a laptop, and you need basically a disk. So, it used to be that all these startups were on the outskirts of our cities, or in you know, more remote areas from center of the city, because they needed space, and the space in the city was expensive. So, in the last three, four years, we're seeing a reversal of that trend. These startups are moving into the center of the city, into the most expensive neighborhoods, because they want to be together. And now they need very, very little space, so you have the advent of this, I don't know whether you know this company, it's an Israeli entrepreneur who lives in New York, who started the company we work. The idea is he takes old buildings and essentially refurbishes them and rents them out as, as, as uh, this uh, common space, you come, you pay them X uh, dollars and you have a month of, of a desk or a cubicle or a large office, it's completely scalable. What's interesting about it, at least in Israel, but I presume that it's the same everywhere, is that immediately professional services rent space in there and they have beer, they have tea, they have uh, mingling spaces. It's a really, really cool thing. And what they need is very, very little space. So they're willing to pay relatively high prices per desk but it's low prices in absolute, so on, on a per square meter, it's a lot of money. So he makes a lot of money. This company is valued, he has, I think, 30 buildings around the world. It's valued at $5 billion as a, based on growth options, okay? So that's, so we have Tel Aviv, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, a city of Tel Aviv runs uh, one of those. Uh, Nazareth uh, runs one, uh, Ra'anana, which is another city. So there's a variety of different places that are, that are providing this space, and it's a very interesting, very interesting um, development. Uh, oops. I guess I, I, I changed this somehow. I'm sorry about that. This is a, this is a uh, slide from, uh, from a, um, somehow it moved. I apologize. This is a, this is a, a slide from um, a website called Angels. Okay, so it's not mine, I just copied this onto this. It, it, it shows you the, the, eco, the financing ecosystem. So since even I can't read what's written there, uh, it just, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly tell you. So these guys are basically accelerators and incubators, both local and, and, and uh, those in the United States and other places. These are local angels. These are foreign angels focusing on Israel. These are various angel clubs. Then you have crowdfunding platforms. You have today crowdfunding platforms for tech. One of them, the, I think the largest one in the world is actually Israeli one called Our Crowd. They actually did a presentation in, in, here uh, in the last couple of days. There are early, uh, early stage VCs, both local, uh, foreign, as well as corporate VCs. It, it turns out that in Israel, over time, uh, the number of uh, VCs went, uh, that, that are Israeli, their proportion over the last six years went from about 40% of all funding to about 15 to 20%. And it's not because they started funding less, it's because there's an influx of, of money from, from foreign VCs. Then you have, uh, lo um, uh, this is early stage VCs, these are late stage VCs, then you have growth capital, venture lending, and then private equity. And all of these, both. And then you, of course, have strategic, strategic partners. So, for example, if you look at Cisco, it could be buying companies, it could be uh, investing in companies, 
uh, it, it can play uh, different different roles. And again, I apologize for this thing being being skewed, but you wouldn't have seen this anyway. It, it's just a, it's just a slide. So the financial the financial ecosystem that developed, and one of the things that developed relatively late is this late stage part, which is now fairly fairly well developed. So this is the Israeli startup ecosystem. So there are, at the center, there are 55,000 startups and growing. Uh, there are eight research universities that generate people and, and technologies, but the, te the technologies and the innovation is not necessarily coming directly from universities. The model in which professor thinks up things and then you have to go and, and implement is not, is not necessarily the, the model that that we uh, that 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 is re the reality. There are 16 uh, t technology transfer offices, so eight universities plus some hospitals plus some centralized uh, TTOs that are catering to smaller uh, entities that can cannot do it. Accelerators, incubators, multinationals, and the venture. Okay, the financing. So this, of course, around it. There is a chief office of chief scientists that promotes that provides grants. There is a military uh, research budgets that promote the different uh, various types of activities as well uh, in the market. By the way, they they actually outsource their research and and development to to in many cases to to companies and universities, and so that that's the ecosystem. Okay, and that ecosystem uh, is uh, uh, growing. So these are the number of companies that are established every year in that domain. These are the number of companies that die every year in that domain. So we're still, we're still growing. At some point, we're going to get to, to steady state because you know, we, we can't grow indefinitely in terms of companies. We're just going to run out of people completely. But, but it was still it turns out that we're still, still not there. And uh, these are just some features of an Israeli entrepreneur. There is sometimes a, a feeling that the Israeli entrepreneur is 22 years old or, or a woman 22 years old and they are, you know, right after they come out of the army, they just immediately start a company and two years later they are multi-billionaires. That's not necessarily the case. Um, there are some rare cases of this, but 73% of entrepreneurs actually have been employed before startup, and those that haven't been employed, you have to remember that they passed through the army. And so they have been employed. They've been doing three, four years of uh, stuff. Some, sometimes stuff that is connected to their enterprise, sometimes not connected, but you know, in some sense they've been, just like here, you get a lot of, a lot of experience when you in the military. They, many of them are repeat entrepreneurs. This is great news for us because repeat entrepreneurs are much more patient, and much more willing or uh, wanting to, to actually establish large companies rather than make a quick exit. So we're seeing complete change in those. And most of them actually do have education even though we have a growing problem with these guys. Because the problem with these guys is not that they are you know, uh, illiterate. The problem with these guys is that these are very, very bright men and women that go to the army, are stationed in really uh, elite units, intelligence and technical units, come out, and when they come out of the gates of their base four years later, somebody is waiting for them with a big check and a car. And then they say, wait a minute, I'm going to go and become you know, a poor student or I'm going to be way making three times the average salary in the country right now. Like tomorrow morning. It's big, you know, so that's what it is. Okay, some of that is, you know, people like Microsoft founder Bill Gates, which, you know, they study and then some of their friends saying, you know, why don't you come and, and work on, on, on this startup? And so they drop out and so But this is, this is a bit of a problem. We don't want 20% of our brightest, you know, kids not, not getting high education, right? That's, uh, so some of them try to do it after they are... And then the age range, but you see that the age range is, 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 uh, is not, not very young. So the average CEO, it's on the one hand is not very young, but on the other hand they are young. The, the average CEO of a startup is 34 years old, at least in the software industry. Uh, now what that does is that a 45-year-old person for that individual is a dinosaur. Okay. 
they sort of don't see what generation they are. So that means that if you lose a job in that industry at the age of 40, 45, 50, it's very hard to get back because part of that industry is completely close to you. Because they want you to work 25 hours a day, you know, and then it's this really high pressure environment because when you start up, you have a very, very clear focus to, to, to get your KPIs and, 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 you know, advance faster before somebody else in, you know, in the next building does the same thing and, and beats you up to it. So that is, that is again, a somewhat problem, but I'll, I'll leave it for, for Israeli government to, to, to deal with that. Uh, so the, the big question, how, how did it happen? And I'm telling you that none of this, none of this was either designed to happen or expected to happen. In fact, when I was talking to people who were doing early startups in the late 80s, they were telling me that people were laughing at them at the mere suggestion that you can export software out of Israel. Okay, today, you know, I think it's about 40% of our exports. Right? And this is, you know, you, everyone in your phone, there is some piece of software in every phone or when you leave a message that is made in Israel. Okay? So, or in your computer or in a variety of other things that, that we use. So, but it was definitely not, nobody, there was no government decision that said, we're going to have this target and, and we're going to do this. So how did it happen? Some of it was by design, pieces of it, much of it by coincidence. But what's, what's interesting in all that is that how that whole thing fell, fell together. So the first most important thing is all the excellence that you see in Israel, and I think basically anywhere, comes out of needs, out of addressing the needs. But you can, you know, if you have big needs, you can either give up and just not address them, then excellence doesn't come. Or you can really sort of get your, wrap your head around it and say, I'm going to, you know, I believe in myself, I'm going to do it, and sort of throw things at it and try, uh, fail, try again, fail, try again, and then after a while you, 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 you do it. So the needs in, in, in Israel were tremendous. If any of you have been to Israel, you would see, uh, you know, you won't see a green country like, like this. We have somewhat less water than you do, but, uh, but you will see country with forests and, and, and flowers and trees and, and, and a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of green. When uh, people were coming to Israel 100 years ago, this was completely barren country. This is the only country that reforested in the world. Most countries deforested, and I'm sorry about the side effects of part of that deforestation on, on you. Uh, it must have been uh, unpleasant. So, but this is the country that actually all the, all the stuff that you see green has been planted, that was by design. Because there was a Jewish agency that was started in 1920s that was, its only goal was to collect money and plant trees. But there was very little arable land a lot of land erosion, very unpredictable climate, very little water, and with years it became less and less uh, precipitation. Uh, not the most uh, you know, uh, welcoming neighborhood that you, could, uh, that you could imagine, but I think you, know, you, could, you could think about that, I mean, you could relate to that. And then the, but, uh, um, so we, need, we had a lot of needs. And so the needs that, that we started developing, uh, we started using uh, innovation, entrepreneurship on the individual and small groups level. It was not, there was no country. We're talking about 1900, 1910, 1920. The country got established in 1948. But the waves of immigration were coming throughout this, throughout this period. And so the universities were established way just like this university was established 110 years ago. You just celebrated 50 years. So it was way, way predated the, 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 uh, the country. Similarly, in, in Israel, we started Technion, started in 1920. Uh, Hebrew University, like I said, was 1925. Uh, agriculture research organization started in 1920. So we had invested a lot of efforts. Luckily, we had an influx of uh, very educated um, European Jews that were fleeing persecutions. So that, that, that helped. So let me give you the degree of need, okay? The report uh, of British government in 1920 said that the uh, water resources 
of the land of Israel, the whole, what they called Palestine at that time, uh, would, no, would, would be enough to, to sustain no more than two million people. Okay, that was it. And they were pretty serious. They were serious people that did it. Uh, just for your information, today's water resources are much smaller than they were then. By precipitation, went down by about 40 percent. 40, and we started it from very little. Um, today, the same resources are used by 12 and a half million people in that space, plus some of the water goes to Jordan, which is another 3 million people. So, but the, the needs were very big, so we needed to address them. So whether it was water usage, whether it was agriculture, whether it was, um, whether it was defense, you know, we understood very, very quickly, very similarly to Singapore, that, you know, there are differences in mass size, right, of, of, of the population. So we have 300 today, we have 8 million people, and this is a lot. We are in a big country. At that time, they had 300,000. Okay, and then this was a huge population around it. And so you definitely, in order to defend yourself, you had to be much, much more technologically and weaponry and intelligence, etc., advanced than anybody that was in your, in your neighborhood. So we started developing that. So all of our excellence comes out of needs. Okay, now we apply that to the needs of others because, uh, you know, we're small and so our needs are somewhat. So, but, that is, but that is the very, very basic thing that... It is, if you want to develop um, expertise, any country that wants to develop expertise, you must start from the needs of, the, 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 because there you will have a, a, a drive, a driver to, 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 to actually accomplish them. The second thing was human capital. Okay, now human capital uh, gets developed through, through two uh, routes in Israel. One is uh, uh, universities, and the universities are pretty good. Mm, uh, and uh, the other route is immigration. And the third route is the army. Okay? So just like I said, in, in 19, uh, 1990s, suddenly about a million point two people out of Soviet Union came to, to, to Israel because the uh, conditions in the, in the former Soviet Union rapidly deteriorated, and anti-Semitism really was on the rise in the early 90s. Later on, it went down, but it was, it was really, people felt really unsafe. So 200,000 people came in one swoop to a country of 4.5 million. 200,000 came in one year. So that created all kinds of challenges in housing, etc., but, but it definitely brought a lot of human capital. At the same time, we canceled the Lavi project, which was a very ambitious project to build our own jet fighter, sort of futuristic jet fighter, which we had the technology, but we just couldn't afford the costs that are, that are associated with that. So they canceled, and so thousands of engineers and scientists were thrown into the market with a lot of technology and a lot of experience. So that was the second part. And so Combine those people that were trained in, differently, in different ways and they were, they were creating a very, very fertile ground for exchange of ideas. Then uh, add to that the IDF, which invested heavily in ICT for its own purposes, in uh, space, in, in cyber, in, uh, in, uh, in communications, in the entire range for, for completely you know, non-commercial non purposes. And so these kids were coming, oops, were coming out of, of, uh, of uh, Israeli Defense Forces. They were very well trained, very well, uh, with a lot of experience, and they were completely overconfident because these kids were put in the, the age of 19 to really tackle really, really major problems. I mean, they were defending their country, like in their literal sense. And so when they come out, they come out with an attitude, if anybody can do it, I can do it. This is sometimes annoying. If you meet Israelis, that is sometimes annoying because they are very, very confident in themselves. This is, you know, but just take it aside. They, they, you know, if you brush it off a little bit, they're nice people, most of them. But, uh, but this is a great characteristic if you want to start a new company, especially if your company is supposed to change the world. Okay? Because most of the companies that start to change the world don't succeed. So you have to be overconfident to even start that. So that's a great... Great. Um, we were also uh, very, very um, uh, lucky that in, 
exactly in the 90s when all these people were coming in and the, the, all these engineers were being freed, the demand for ICT, to, to, for ICT, for information communication technologies, was just skyrocketing. Everybody was tooling up and everything was was being, you know, overblown. Uh, as we know, in retrospect, there was overblown a little bit too much. But it was great because suddenly anybody with, a, with an idea could get financing. And the financing came from the government pro pro program that was called USMA. USMA was one of many programs that were trying to, you know, introduce that activity into, into the market. And so, a friend of mine, this is somebody who, who started USMA, was my classmate from, from Hebrew University. And he said that I would like to in, introduce, first of all, the ecosystem of, of financing, because it didn't exist at that time. The, the, there were only some VCs from, from the United States, but they were far, there was not an ideal flow, so they were, you know, occasionally coming in. So they essentially put $80 million and said, split it into eight pieces and said, we're going to give you $10 million, bring expertise, VC expertise, uh, match us one to, I believe, five at least. And if, you, if, if your profitability is not that great, we'll subsidize it. So it's your money, it's a grant. And if you, uh, but if you succeed, you can buy us out. Just return the money so it's a, it's a benefit for the upside. You don't have to share with the government your upside, but you are protected from the downside. So immediately eight, uh, eight uh, groups formed. One of them was called Vertex which was a third of the money came from Temasek, and from that moment on, Temasek and Israel is a, is a really love story. I mean, this is, a, this is a, a very, very important player in the market, and the player that understands the market and, and, and is constantly expanding its presence and actually made a lot of money out of this. So this was not something, it was not charity. Um, and so all these things together come, come together around, and NASDAQ was booming, so you had the outlet for the late stage. So that is how the system created. You know, we didn't overthrow, you know, Gorbachev. That was not design. We didn't, uh, we didn't uh, generate the demand for ICT. We did, one of the things that happened is that we did plan, you know, IDF, but for completely different reasons. And we did put use mice, was one of the programs out of many that didn't work. This one actually caught on and uh, was very, very successful and started the VC industry. So this is how it all got uh, now. Uh, but there was one ingredient that was important and sort of was underlying. And here I come back to the innovation of type two. Because, you know, um, we are living in the world that is rapidly changing. The technology is changing at the pace that never been seen before. Okay, and when technology changes, it's not just uh, about uh, marginal changes. It's about the phone, whether it's Android or iPhone, that you have in your pocket was unimaginable its effect on our lives was unimaginable 15 years ago. I mean, we're doing things completely differently. And so suddenly professions, all professions disappearing. Okay, and so this is the type, this is the time for type two innovation. You have to adapt to new realities. Look at Nokia. When I came in 2009 into my position, the first question that people were addressing to me in the first interview was, how come Israel doesn't have a Nokia? After a year and a half, they stopped asking that question, because now it was, well, how lucky that we don't have Nokia. It's not lucky, it's not unlucky. We don't have Nokia because of a variety of reasons, but Nokia, or Kodak, I was professor at the University of Rochester, I was watching that company die after inventing digital photography. They invented digital photography never could bring themselves to think about themselves as a digital company. They thought about themselves as a chemical company. I was teaching their executives. They couldn't, they couldn't bring themselves. I said, what do you mean? We, 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 you know, we understand chemicals. I said, but there's no chemicals anymore. And so they died. It was almost suicide. They just invented the, the gun and, and shot themselves. <laughs> but, this is, but this is that type of second type of innovation because they were excellent in chemistry. They were perfecting their environment for 100 years, not 100, a little bit less. 
Eight years since 1924, when they started, when George uh, Eastman started Kodak uh, in, in, in Rochester in 1924. They didn't have the second type innovation capabilities, and neither did Nokia. By the way, Intel missed completely the, the, the mobile revolution. So they are now, only now, starting to get in. This was, uh, you know, this was a... Uh, IBM executive in 1980 said that the most the world will need in terms of computers is about 10 to 30 mainframes spread around the world. <laughs> We're talking about 1980. Okay, now imagine where, you know, of course that all these mainframes would have been made by, by IBM, but, but the several, at most several hundred. Now, talk about the second. And so, now, why are we more predisposed to the type 2 innovation? Because uh, of uh, the culture. Why did this culture evolve? Well, because it had to. Because the, the people that you call, that we call ourselves Jews today, are descendants of about two and a half million people that lived right around the birth of Christ in the areas surrounding the land of Israel. If we were to be normally allowed to normally progress through ages for 2,000 years, we should have been between half a billion and a billion people today. Okay, we are 12 million. So there was a huge attrition because we were, you know, pushed around and the changing countries and people who couldn't adapt either didn't survive physically or didn't survive as Jews. So the, those that survived as Jews, because it was difficult to be a Jew. So you had to develop something. If you wanted to be a Jew and survive, you had to become adaptable to change in condition quite rapidly. Okay, so the culture is, is, is there. And, and if you take it into account that throughout the last 120 years, with all these needs and, the, and, and all this adaptivity to changing conditions constantly in, in the land of Israel, which was not easy, we perfected that skill to... We are, we are very um, uh, good in improvisation. We're very good in, in uh, quickly focusing on a target and, and reaching it. Everybody is very, very much target-oriented. We are completely devoid of uh, respect for authority. I mean, the basic Judaism, you, you have to understand that Judaism as a religion has no priests. You don't have anybody between you and God. I mean, this is a direct line. From Israel, it's a local call. But the, but the, um, but the you know, what, what is rabbi? Rabbi is not, is not uh, is a teacher. Okay, and even with rabbi, you're supposed to argue. The way people study Torah is you would pair two people, you know, two guys up. I mean, women were not allowed to study Torah for, until very recently. And so you would, you would pair two guys up, and they had to argue with each other about what's written. I mean, it's written. It says, you know, sentence is written, you know, what is it to argue about? But no, the idea is that there is a lot of hidden meaning and we have to discover it through, through sort of fighting with each other. Not fighting, but, uh, you know, arguing. And then the rabbi comes and says, no, he is right. And the other guy says, no, he's not. And so, lack of authority in, in, in this very non-hierarchical society. You call everybody in the vicinity of the prime minister, except me, since I was not born in Israel, I couldn't bring myself to call him by his nickname. I mean, this is prime minister. I mean, come on. I mean, this is something like, uh, but this is a very, you, you know, you call your superior officer uh, by his first name in the army. There's no, you know, saluting and this is all silly stuff. You do it in the first basic training. At the end of, in the, in the, in the unit, it's just, I'm just explaining to you so how, you know, you go into the classroom, it's a mayhem. They are, it, it, it's something, there are a lot of negative things that come with that. It's really difficult to teach a class in, in, in Israel, even in the university. But, but that also creates all these attitude of not taking anything for granted. And so if this is like that, I can change it. And if I can change it today, I can change it tomorrow. So that, that attitude is something that you create over, uh, over many, many, many centuries, not, not by design. 
So there is something in there that is, uh, and it's, you know, we tried to test in the water. It's not in the water. It must be something cultural. So that is an important ingredient, and I think, but even that is not enough, because what happened to, to, uh, to us, even within that culture, there was a change in the last 20 years. The proverbial Jewish mother uh, always wanted to brag to her friend about her son, who is either a doctor or a lawyer. I mean, that's, you know, what, what else is there, right? And now, there is not clear that these are the two first professions. My, my son has a startup. I mean, he's on his second startup. Or the, he could be even saying, the interesting thing is, she could be even saying she just opened the startup with finance and the startup closed. He's now in his own second startup. So this is not a failure. This is a learning process. Okay, it, 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 it was not like that 15, 20 years ago. So there is a change, and so when somebody tells me, look, in, in Singapore, people are much more, you know, kids are much more focused on sort of steady jobs, etc. That's true, and I understand. This is cultures that, that developed in a very, very stable, in very stable societies, societies that, that lived long, long, very long stretches, thousands and hundreds of years in the same place over with the same rules where very, that had to be governed by centrally and very, very hierarchical. But that doesn't mean that in small groups you cannot start creating this new changed attitude and then create role models out of these groups to show to, show to others and create. You don't need a lot of people to be in that all of that, and we are the highest in, in the world, in the startup universe, there are probably 6-7% of the labor force. And it's now, you know, 10 years ago, it was much, much smaller. So I think that, you know, you can, it definitely helps to have, to have this risk-taking culture, but it's definitely not, uh, I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, such an such a, um, uh, obstacle. And to to, to tell you the truth, I, I was here two years ago, and I was talking to a lot of officials and a lot of people in that space, and I was just shown numbers for the last two years. The, the progress is, is amazing here. I mean, in terms of startup activity, in terms of innovation, in terms of, in the, and it's still early, but I think, I think you are on a great, great path. One thing that needs to, be, needs to be said that we usually associate it with innovation in a particular sort of ICT areas, but in fact, Israeli innovation is quite versatile. That's true that we are in very good in mobile, in applications, in, uh, in various uh, um, uh, you know, chip designs and, 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 and things like that, uh, cyber, etc., but we're also fairly good in medical medical devices and even in some pharma. We are very good in space. We're one of the 10 countries in the world that have full space capabilities. Again, not because we wanted to be the smallest country ever to have space capabilities, because we sort of need to know what's going on around us. But that, you know, given that we had the need, uh, we, had to, we had to figure out how to do that. And given all kinds of specifications that I won't get into, we have to be uh, very, very, we have to miniaturize our satellites. So our satellites are about one-fourth of the size of comparable quality satellites in the world, and that's, a, that's an excellence that we are now working with NASA and Galileo of Europeans. Uh, this, by the way, allows us to do a lot, for example, on precision agriculture, or monitoring emissions, etc. There's a lot of that going on. Agriculture, we are, we are uh, in a variety of areas. Just to, to give you an example, you know, how do you supply milk in a country which doesn't have pastures and uh, is very hot? And we know that cows don't give milk when it's hot. And then nowhere to graze. What do you do? Well, you know, the first innovation is that sometimes somebody figured out, let's take the cow, put it under shed. So it's not hot. Let, but it's still hot because it's just not in the sun. So let's put some, some uh, ventilator with some water on it. So it, it's cool. And once it's standing, you have to feed something. Well, let's just adjust the feeding. So the cows, Israeli cows, are, are um, since the 70s, are the most, they have the highest yields of milk by far anywhere in the world. In fact, Israeli technology, there was, we showed that it's possible. To, in the United States, the dairy industry moved from Michigan and Wisconsin to Texas. It was always in the north. 
because, you know, for, for obvious reasons. So, and, and there are a variety of, uh, we, for example, when, when we built the first um, introductory farm near Beijing, uh, they said, well, it must be your cows. So we took Chinese cows and, uh, you know, brought them into the shed and fed them, put the chip in their, in their ear. And so when the cow comes to feed, it actually eats its own menu, right? That cow, that specific cow gets, you know, optimized menu. And so these cows started giving between two and a half thousand liters, they started giving 8,000 liters. I said, well, wait a minute, how did you do that? And we, just, we just put some, some, some water and we, we put some good food. You know, if you start eating, the cow is, is enjoying her, her lunch. So, um, but in Israel, it's about 13,000. Okay, so it, there's still some room to go. But, uh, again, water, along with Singapore, we're the most efficient user of water in the world. Okay, we have, since 1970s, we have halved the use of water per capita, even though the country became much, much more, uh, uh, much richer and much, uses much more, much more water in, in a lot of uh, uses, because we use a combination of desalination, uh, reclamation of about 85% of our wastewater, and drip irrigation, about 94% of all our crops are drip irrigated. Uh, in combination, just saves huge amounts of water, plus policies, pricing, etc. So, um, uh, Premier Li Keqiang asked us to to actually take a city in, in China and 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 actually, you know, try to bring the water ecosystem into a whole city in China to to show how it's how it works. And uh, EduSoft and, and others. So I just wanted to say that it's not just the, 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 the tech, the ICT that, that we're good at. And these are actually the areas in which we can be very helpful to a lot of countries uh, in the world because they now increasingly faces the, face the problems that we faced in, in the past. 2014, so we started increasing the amount of capital that we raise. I was talking about late stage, so there's much more capital. There's about $7 billion of exits, out of which uh, two, $2 billion uh, in IPOs. So this is a new phenomenon for us. In 2015, uh, in the first half, we already raised uh, $2.1 billion relative to $1.6, and already have $5.3 billion, uh, which is 76% of uh, 2014. So it's, a, it's going to be even better year. So things are looking good, partially, because there is a growing demand from China uh, and other Asian companies in Israeli high tech. They discovered two and a half years ago, China discovered Israel, a year and a half ago, Japan discovered Israel, Korea always worked with us, Singapore always worked with us. So, but we have now flows of, of, of resources uh, coming um, into, into, into Israel. Uh, Temasek, uh, Temasek, sorry, uh, over 20 year history, I told you, very, very important partner for us. And so from 2016 and beyond, we are looking to st from the startup to scale up. So we hope that in 10 years there will be a new book called The Scale Up Nation. But the problem is that we can do it internally. So we believe that given that, given that we have a already vibrant ecosystem, we have technological talent, we have small market, that's not very good for scale-up. And we have a small manufacturing base, which sort of, if you think about sort of, let's say, American or Japanese economy or Korean economy, there's a big, big industrial base and a lot of innovation on the top, but relative to the base, it has to supply a lot of work to the base. We look more like a mushroom. Okay, we have a very small manufacturing database, uh, manufacturing base, and the big technology uh, top, the reason being because we develop technologies not because of the, not because the need to provide the jobs to, to, to this manufacturing database, but because of other reasons, because we had to survive with water or we, because we had to defend ourselves. So the technology levels are high, but not. So that makes us a great partner for scale up for a large country. Why? Because we're very happy to share our technology because the only way we can scale it up is elsewhere. American company, when it starts its, its uh, journey, it thinks about U.S. market as its primary market and maybe, maybe, maybe in the distant future it will go elsewhere. Israeli company, like a Singaporean company, starts its journey 
with thinking about American market and the European market, or perhaps today Asian market. So we already we're happy to to go and partner with everybody with large markets because the only way for this ecosystem to prosper is to to scale it up elsewhere. So if others benefit a lot and we benefit a little, the difference in size will be enough for us to 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 to. to but we're also a very good one, a good partner for small economies for a different reason. For example, I've discovered, you know, it sort of dawned on me uh, in the last few days that Israel and Singapore, instead of growing each other, you know, each in their own uh, ecosystem, if we grow our ecosystem by, by closely cooperating, we're going to reach critical masses, which are very important in various areas, much faster together than on our own. And since both of us don't have markets, or to speak of locally, and each of us has, has um, advantages. We have advantages in the West. Uh, Singapore has advantages in the East. We can complement each other, and we are definitely planning to try to, 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 pro to propose uh, close cooperation. By the way, I've been amazed on how warmly uh, Israel and um, myself uh, specifically, but Israel in general is received in Singapore. It's really heartwarming. And uh, so now I'm, I'm just going to last two minutes about the Startup Nation Central, which is it's a, a company, it's a non-for-profit company that I'm joining today. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, organization. It's been inspired by the book. There's a specific gentleman by the name of Paul Singer, who runs a hedge fund in New York, uh, decided that he wants to help Israel by making sure that the ecosystem that so miraculously appeared almost out of nowhere uh, will continue to grow and flourish and will be connected to the world's problems, much bigger problems, and will be trying to solve them um, together with, with its partners. And so he set up an organization about two, two years ago, uh, and they were sort of trying trial and error, um, and uh, they, um, they now mostly doing collecting information about the ecosystem, so it has one of the best, probably the best database and, and, and knowledge of uh, connectivity into the ecosystem. And it does, it brings uh, that connectivity into partners around the world, large corporates, governments, investors, large investors, as well as academia. Uh, we have much better, uh, much, not much better, much bigger and broader uh, plans, so we're now in the process of uh, of uh, creating strategy for the ecosystem, but the ecosystem will be knowledge-based, so it will be the best resource. Uh, sorry, Startup Central, Startup Nation Central will be knowledge-based. We will be the best resource about the ecosystem. Nobody uh, else uh, will come close because we're going to work on this and continue building on what's there. We're going to be adaptive. We're going to look at the ecosystem, almost like the government does, and identify problems and through cooperative activities, we're going to convene, enable, and connect in order to solve these problems, open the, con the ecosystem to uh, opportunities around the world. And this is a big place which I want to start. So our next collaboration starts here. Thank you very much.